Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany. Please join me in the call to worship. Let us worship God who is the one in whom we trust. Let us confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us call upon him in our heart, confess him with our mouths, and worship him in spirit and truth. to confession. The one who pardons, heals, and strengthens all who repent calls us to name our failings and our hopes. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Holy and all-powerful God, who commands all spirits, comforts those in distress, and casts out destructive forces, we confess that we are unable to do your will. We protect what is familiar and reject what is unknown. We admire those with courage, but excuse ourselves when we falter from the truth. We forget that you are always with us and that with you all things are possible. Forgive us, lead us, and make us new. Remove our desire to heed false prophets and show us your way. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 
made you and knows your every thought, hears you now and forgives you all your sin. You have been redeemed through Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, who is Alpha and Omega, all in all. saying, the peace of Christ be with you. It is our great joy to welcome you to worship with us on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany. I'm grateful for the conversations that are now emerging from our combined youth confirmation class with students from United Presbyterian Church of Cuyahoga Falls, as well as the good ministry that we continue to accomplish with our tweens and our youth in the midst of this pandemic. Please note that I will be away on study leave this coming week as I work toward the completion of my final doctoral project. It is entitled, Blessed to be a Blessing, Self-Giving as a Christian Discipleship Practice. There will be no Zoom Bible study on Monday evening, and on February the 7th, the Reverend Dr. Sandy Selby will be ably filling the pulpit here at Westminster. Also next Sunday, our tweens will be receiving your food donations in the driveway behind the church from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. You can find a list of items for which we are in need in your bulletin. Friends, we are each in this journey together, that we might not let idols grow and multiply in our hands. So let us give of ourselves, our time, and our possessions out of love for this creation and honor toward what we have each been given. Let us receive our morning offering.
invite the youngest disciples among us to gather around as we share this time together. And today I want to speak with you a little bit about a word called authority. Now authority often means that you have power or control over something or someone else. And I brought something, this is an old remote control, I recognize that. You have one that's much more sophisticated than this, I'm sure. But this old remote control reminds us of all the different things that we might be able to do. We could turn a TV, for example, on or off. We could turn the volume up or down. We can change the channels. Here's a button that would allow us to turn on a VCR. Maybe you don't even know what those are. Or cable TV. Maybe you have Hulu or Netflix at your house streaming. Things get a lot more sophisticated, but in every generation, we have ways that we can control all of these different technologies around us. We can type a few buttons on our cell phone and all kinds of things will open to us immediately. We can talk to our smart speaker at home. If you have one of those and it's connected to the internet, you can tell it to play your favorite song. You can even tell it to tell you a story or a joke, and it will. We get behind the wheels of these large, expensive automobiles every day, and we control the path and the direction that we want it to take us and guide us. And all of these are pretty heady things, right? We recognize how much control we have over the world around us. But we don't control everything, do we? There are so many things in this world that are beyond our control. We don't control the weather. We don't control oftentimes what happens on the world stage. We oftentimes don't even control what's happening in our own lives. There's something that's happening around us and we're having to react to it. We can, of course, control how we respond to those things, though. And as I think about authority and power today, I am reminded of Jesus, one who had all authority, not only in heaven, but also here on earth. And what that means for us as his followers, to know that Jesus is ultimately in control is to be reminded that we don't have to control everything. Sometimes we simply need to listen and let the one who is in control take care of us. Please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Dear God, we are grateful for your self-revelation, the ways in which you reveal yourself to us in Jesus Christ. We know and proclaim and profess that he was the ultimate authority, the one who was in control, not only of the heavens, but also of this, our home, the earth. We know that he had the ability to cast out evil from among us and that he taught and spoke as one with authority and authority given to him from God. Help us to be good listeners, that we might go where he guides and leads us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy Spirit, your people call out for understanding. Bring to our yearning hearts and minds the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The first lesson is from Psalm 111, verses 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, 
and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And our second lesson this day comes to us from Mark's Gospel in the first chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. I invite you now to hear the word of God. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded by his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On the field of battle, the commander has reached a decision point. Should the battalion maintain their position? Or should they now push ahead and launch an assault in an effort to penetrate the defenses of their adversaries? The consequences of either decision are no less than life or death. In the chaos of the moment, amid the roar of gunfire and the shouts of the soldiers, the leader knows that he will be judged in keeping with the fate of his command. Soon he makes his decision. They will be moving forward, strategically leaving their present post and laying claim to higher ground some 100 yards ahead. He signals to the soldiers who with fear and trembling follow his instructions. While authority comes in many forms, it is always a combination of knowledge and expertise, a knowledge and expertise that is recognized by others. The soldiers trust their commander because they have trained with him and because they believe in the system that resulted in his promotion. Therefore, when the decision point arrives and the order is given, they do not hesitate to put their lives on the line in service of a common mission. One becomes an authority in any field through training or experience or by the power of personal persuasion. Oftentimes it is a combination of each of these working in tandem to get others to act in a certain manner or to defer to one's judgment or to coalesce around a certain idea. 
And authority is not singular. It is found in many different personality types. I think about a grandmother telling a story of hardship while children and grandchildren listen with rapt attention. She need not even raise her voice to make the point. Her family recognizes that her words are packed with wisdom and her narrative, her story is entirely authoritative. In our second lesson this morning, we are challenged by this concept of authority. Who has it? Why do they have it? And is it being wielded justly? Here we learn about a man named Jesus from a tiny hamlet called Nazareth, who effectively challenges the religious and the political leaders and authorities of his day. He could not match their formal education, and he was not raised in an influential family. So it comes as a surprise to all of us when Jesus speaks but just a few words, and grown men leave their old lives behind and follow him. And it is nothing less than astonishing when large crowds soon gather and follow him everywhere that he goes. Passages like these make me uncomfortable, and I think that this is at least part of the point. You see, there is a message here for people like me who have dedicated our lives to formal structures of authority. First college, then seminary, then the established church. There is little to distinguish me from the scribes in this passage. And now that I am a credentialed insider, I want to know by what authority Jesus says and does these things. Admittedly, I am not as satisfied as I once was by the holes in his formal training. That short stint in the temple at Passover as an adolescent boy, and now his full immersion baptism offered by his cousin in the wilderness, no matter how intelligent and promising Jesus may have been, and he certainly was both, this is hardly the resume that I would come to expect of a prospective minister in our denomination. I am not suggesting that Jesus came to dismantle institutional religion, but I am arguing that he came to remind his followers that any authority that we receive as God's people is ultimately granted from on high, and that if God extends the call, then God is also more than capable and will equip individuals for divine service in this divine kingdom. Prior to the pandemic, I would often go to one of the local libraries here in Akron to read and write in preparation for my final doctoral project. I was surrounded by books, I was knee deep in research, and I was trying to get it right. One day, two men came inside the library and sat at the table beside me. They were talking very loudly, and I was perturbed. Did they not know that this was a library? Did they not know that people were studying there? Could they not see my large pile of books, my need for silence and concentration? Did they not notice how important my work was? Who did they think they were anyway? Soon their small talk came to an end and they began to focus on the real task at hand with the younger man serving as a mentor to the older man who wanted to learn how to effectively preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I did not agree with much of what was said that day in the library regarding the interpretation of the text at hand. But I also recognized that my context and my training 
and my expectations were entirely different. And I was reminded that if God calls, then God will also equip individuals for divine service in the kingdom. When Jesus taught and when he healed people, the scribes were often perturbed. Who does this guy think he is anyway? Did he not know that they were the ones who were going about the business of their father's house? Did he not know that he could not just walk into the synagogue without a big stack of books before claiming to be some authority? Strikingly, it is not the scribes, but rather the evil forces who immediately recognize Jesus' authentic spiritual power. They know who he is. They understand his purpose. And they are ultimately afraid that he will vanquish them. So in an attempt to control him, they call him by name. And yet Jesus knows them as well. And he will not be so easily controlled. Friends, have you ever tried to control God? Have you ever hoped that Jesus might do your bidding for you? Do you believe that when you address the Lord in prayer that God is obliged to provide all that you have asked for and then some? Or do you recognize that on account of our petitions, it is actually we who are being changed more than anything else? God knows who you are. Your every need, your every breath, your every desire, and God speaks to you through the authoritative revelation of Jesus Christ. The one who displayed his power in words that astonished and in deeds that have no equal here on earth. For some mysterious reason, God also chose to work in partnership with us. And at the end of Matthew's gospel, we are commissioned to service with these words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, says Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. May it be so. All thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to join me as we affirm our faith together using the words from Colossians chapter 1. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all things. Friends, let us pray together. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For the healing of earth and all its creatures, hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For the church's willingness to cast out demons in its midst, for congregations that are in turmoil, for the healing of divisions between the followers of Christ Jesus, hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For leaders of nations, 
for those who have great wealth, for those who have too much power, for those who have destructive weapons, and for those who have none. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For those who are victims of others' idolatry, for children who have no one to listen to their cries for food and shelter, for parents who cannot answer the needs of their children, for peacemakers and diplomats, for those who give through charities, and for those who use the law to make policies for the greater good. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For all who are in pain and in need of care, especially those we name in our hearts before you now, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For the wisdom to fear you rightly, the power to withstand changes in our own lives that bring us closer to you, for the ability to give thanks for the people who have brought us to this time, our ancestors, our teachers, our pastors, and martyrs of every age, Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Into your hands we commend all those for whom we pray, and those it would be easy to forget. We ask your blessing on all your people, that we may come at last to the truth around your banquet table that has no end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray silently. Finally, together as the people of God, let us offer the words of the Lord's Prayer, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
out into the world fully known by God. So where there is fear, remember the authority of Christ Jesus. Where there is need of love, give it. Where there is pain, bring peace. For you are loved by the one who redeems and freed to live by the word of life. Go in peace with the knowledge of God's power that is given to the church, the body of Christ, for the sake of the life of the world. Amen.